So we take that fear and that feeling of helplessness and we decide that we're going to attack something that we think we can get control over, demonizing somebody that's been dead since 1961. And I can really get all his books banned. God knows everywhere I can. Well, then I'm going to really have accomplished something. So there's an enormous amount of I think, disingenuous displacement, which actually evidences no effective change on the issue. Well, it seems to me that one of the ways that we can hold all of this is to understand Jung as a phenomenologist. That when he was at his best, he was able to observe or attempt to observe himself and others and the events around him as phenomena that rises out of a deeper and more mysterious wellspring. He, over the evolution of his work, depersonalized psychic phenomena. He became less and less interested in blaming the individual ego for its actions or inactions or even its fantasies, but tried to trace a root to something more mysterious that is pressing upon the minds of individuals and the minds of groups. And he was attempting to describe that. I think it's impossible for him to have been totally objective in that realm, which I think he admitted in, in Cross's writings in all ways. But when he was writing about all of the archetypal phenomena and seeking to catalog it, not from the perspective of an expert that knows all of this, but from somebody who is discovering a way of orienting and using what was happening around him as a kind of laboratory to exercise this application of his new method. So for him to look at the patients yeah. that he had mm -hmm. and to ask about the phenomena that he was observing and the field from which that was rising, and then to apply that awkwardly or not yeah. to cultures, groups, subgroups, even his own analytic institute, and ask the same question. I don't believe that was meant to be offensive, although his struggle to find objective language is something I think that he tried throughout the course of his entire professional life. So when I look at his struggle to find language, to talk about Wotan, for instance, it's perfectly congruent with how he attempted to describe all manner of other things, assuming that psyche is actually real, <laughs> both individually and through the collective unconscious into larger and larger aggregates. And to try to use his intuition, his access to mythology, any other resources, to try to find some kind of pattern that could be named. And then as an intuitive, and he describes this in his early work on typology, to get a sense of where something has come from and where it might be going. And to speak in those very broad terms doesn't put him in a particularly prophetic standpoint. It doesn't put him as some kind of political expert who should be using perfect language in order to change the fates of nations. It puts him in this realm of being a psychological researcher who is trying to describe mm -hmm. something to himself and to the small group of people at that time who are around him. Mm -hmm. And from that standpoint, if we were to maintain that more phenomenological standpoint, it's difficult to blame Jung for describing the phenomena that he was able to perceive. And our reactions to his words based on what they mean to us now or what we infer for them is part of our own self-inquiry about what is happening in our own psyches. Mm. Someone uses a word and my psyche turns red or purple or glows mm. with warmth or becomes exhausted and sleepy. Is something to do with my soul and the meaning that I make of somebody else's language and their words. So I'm highly resistant to wanting to blame Jung or any other deceased philosopher 
for the words that they used, but I am interested in how my psyche reacts to the things that have been said. I think the concern, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ronnie. No, go ahead, go ahead. I think the concern that we may all be having is not so much about how Jung functioned as a human being or as a theorist or the head of a psychological association decades and decades ago. I think the concern, which perhaps isn't being languaged openly enough, is how the language and ideas of any published person can be re-weaponized to manipulate the political sphere, and to justify things that are frightening. So the fact that Jung's language could be purposed in a way to seem to support an interest in anti-Semitism is particularly frightening in a current world where there is good evidence that anti-Semitism is on the rise. And so we become concerned about any of the material that could be weaponized to fuel a phenomena that is happening right in front of Mm -hmm. us. That's what makes this material feel dangerous or perhaps Mm. even relevant to to a current topic. I think your idea of weaponizing is really important. And the... The sense of projection that goes on behind the motivation to weaponize. This idea of, I use the word blame. So I think as soon as we're starting to blame, Mm. one way we think about that psychologically is we are now projecting some aspect likely of ourselves onto the other. And to what extent are we willing to reflect. I mean, this is what we try to do so much in our work, to try to understand what part of this is me, what part of this is you, where's the hook, you know, all of that. I do think we are living in a climate now where words are easily being weaponized. And I share a deep concern with you, Joseph, on this matter. And I have enormous respect for Jung because he was willing to be vulnerable, make himself vulnerable after the war. And he wrote after the catastrophe and he wrote Fight with the Shadow in 1946. And here he really, he becomes very open with us in letting us know kind of what he missed. That, you know, that he, he openly says he didn't see some things. And he then yeah. talks about Hitler and the tremendous amount of, of evil, the psychopathic qualities of it. He also talks about, and I think this is, for me, is so fascinating and such a really helpful part of our Jungian perspective, which is the way that he talks about the collective inferiority in, in Germany as a result of their losing World War I, the amount of starvation, the humiliation, just the, uh, the economic depletion that went on in this country. And on the positive end, I think he, in, he did view Wotan as some kind of initial helpful energies, a kind of compensation, if you will to restore for a kind of rebirth Mm. and whatever. And um, that we could say was a very hopeful kind of positive outlook. Um, But he was, uh, mm, how should we say, not as consciously aware of the darker parts of this. After the war, he absolutely was. And he, I, I find his writing those two essays in particular, Mm -hmm. really, really powerful essays. And he talks about sort of the tendency to kind of want to see the criminal out there, you know, and to what extent are we really willing to see the criminal in ourselves and how we are quickly able to split this off from ourselves and 
willingly uh, wanting to project that such that we have the scapegoat, right? And this whole idea of the scapegoat phenomena, and that has certainly been something that Jewish people have, have carried, that idea of the scapegoat complex and so forth. And so for me, there's a lot of redeeming that Jung does in terms of being open Mm -hmm. about his getting some stuff wrong, you know, uh, in terms of how he actually initially Mm -hmm. thought of what was going on in Nazi Germany in the early uprising of Hitler. Um, And that what we really all, what we all so much need to do is be able to stay awake to our tendencies to weaponize, which I think is blaming, which I think is projection, and how that can become, let's see, it's a, it's like a virus. It's a psychic virus or a psychic state of possession, mm-hmm. right? And in the absence of a healthy enough psychic immune system, be it individual or in the collective, there's a whole state of possession that can take place and to what extent we might be seeing some elements of this in our world today as well. There's also an element of displacement, that old good Freudian defense, that we're out in the world and we feel helpless. There are frightening things that we can observe phenomenologically, reading the newspaper, watching the news, maybe things we're hearing in our own families or seeing in our own neighborhoods. And So we take that fear and that feeling of helplessness and we decide that we're going to attack something that we think we can get control over, like demonizing somebody that's been dead since 1961. (laughs) If I can really convince people that Jung was an anti-Semite son of a bitch and I can really get all his books banned, God knows everywhere I can, well then I'm going to really have accomplished something because I can't possibly go down the road and talk to or confront the people that are flying a Nazi flag one street over and have a bunch of, you know, frightening things going on in that house. But you know what I can do is sit here and really try to take Jung down or fill in the blank. So there's an Mm -hmm. enormous amount of, I think, disingenuous displacement, which I see not just around Jung, but among any number of writings or public figures, which actually has no effective evidence is no effective change on the issue. You could wipe all of Jung's writings off the face of the earth and you wouldn't change anti-Semitism one bit in terms of what's happening right around the corner from your own home. Mm -hmm. But you would swear that you had done something really substantive by making sure that that's where you're going to put all your heat. And that's this false sense of displacement and even magical thinking. Mm. So it is good that we're talking about this because we're trying to create a certain amount of frame of understanding around Jung's writings. But I really want to confront the fantasy material that's being pushed into this Mm -hmm. topic by certain writers and certain lecturers. Mm -hmm.